Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Debbie Stevens and I'm a CLL expert at the Huntsman Cancer Institute at University of Utah and a member of the CLL Society uh, Medical Advisory Board. I'm really honored today to be joined by Dr. Lin and I'm gonna have him introduce himself a little bit more here. Hi, my name is Dr. Kevin Lin. Uh, I'm affiliated with Brigham and Women's Hospital and I'm working with Dr. Matt Davids who is with the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Great, great to have you with us today. Today, we're really gonna be focusing on some research that your group presented at ASH 2022. Um, and the title of uh, the abstract that you guys presented was Patient Characteristics, Treatment Patterns and Outcomes Following Covalent BTK Inhibitor Discontinuation in a Contemporary Cohort of Chronic Lymphocytic Leukemia, Small Lymphocytic Lymphoma Patients. Um, so if you could just start by giving us a brief overview of your research and, and what you were aiming to look at. Yeah, great question. So I'll, I'll frame my answer first by saying that the, the treatment landscape for CLL has changed a lot in the last 10 years, as we know, and there's been a big shift away from standard chemotherapies and towards uh, targeted therapies, among them inhibitors of BGK or Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And a lot has been made of the benefits of these medications and that they're able to afford better survival um, and have less toxicity. But something that's been less studied is what comes of patients who are initially treated with these inhibitors and are subsequently discontinued for various reasons, whether due to disease progression uh, or due to intolerability. And that's the, that's the subset of patients that this study is trying to characterize. Yeah, and I, I think I, rem I recall the Ohio State group published something similar to this back in 2015, I think it was, and, you know, so much has changed in the landscape, and so I'm, I, I'm really glad to see you updating this data to give us kind of a more modern um, outlook on what happens to these patients. Uh, so what were your major findings? Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, the Ohio State group in 2015 did publish uh, a, a set of data that's similar kind of in nature to this study. There was another study by the Mayo Group, I think in 2019, that was also similar. I'll just point out before I get into what we saw, the distinction between our data and their data um, has to do with the degree of pretreatment in the patients that we're evaluating. And so um, as expected with uh, a more modern cohort now that uh, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib and now xanabrutinib have now been approved for some time, um, these patients that we're characterizing are much less pretreated. So in the Ohio State Group, those patients received them on, I think, a median of three prior therapies. And in the Mayo group, it was two prior therapies. And in our study, the majority of patients, 60% of patients were treated either in the first or second line setting with the BTK inhibitor. And, uh, you know, the findings are, are very quite uh, consistent with what those groups had shown, which is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, we saw that a majority of patients, just over 55% of patients who discontinued BTK inhibitor therapy, it was due to side effects. And slightly less than 50% of patients uh, who discontinued therapy, were, it was due to progression of their disease. Um, and this is consistent, again, with, with the prior data suggesting that, uh, that the, the biology is similar, um, and yet um, it's important to, to recognize that as the patients that we are now being that, that are now being treated with BTK inhibitors are now being treated earlier on. And so these are the patients that we were going to be treating moving forward. Great. And um, can you tell me, do you have enough data to say what kind of side effects these patients discontinued therapy for? So the majority of the discontinuations were either due to atrial fibrillation or bleeding. And I'll just mention that of the patients uh, in our study, the majority of them were treated with and then discontinued uh, ibrutinib, and a smaller subset of those were treated with and discontinued acalabrutinib. And of course, as we know, as patients are moving towards acalabrutinib, we suspect that, that, that these side effects will continue to go down given that that medication and xanabrutinib have been associated with fewer adverse side effects. Yeah, I think I read in your data that 88% of the patients that were studied, which is a, a reasonably um, a small group at 67 patients, they had received ibrutinib and the remaining people had received acalbrutinib. Um, uh, so 
how do you think this will change? Let's say you did this same cohort of patients, the same research on it, but let's say patients were receiving acalabrutinib or the newly approved BTK inhibitor zanubrutinib. It's always hard to predict, but my anticipation would be that of the patients who were discontinued from either of those medications, that the balance would be shifted towards disease progression. I think the hope is that many fewer of those patients would be discontinued for reasons due to medication toxicity. And, and maybe stay on longer, maybe have a later disease progression because they're able to stay on drug longer. I think that would be an interesting set of data to see in the future. Um, your group made a, a special point to comment on something called Richter's transformation. And this is, um, uh, for folks who don't know, this is when CLL changes over into more aggressive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And you made a comment that the, the you saw about 5% of patients had Richter's transformation as a reason for discontinuation. How does this compare to other studies? So this is a little bit lower than other studies, which typically report between around 9 or 10 percent. Um, it's a little bit unclear to us as to why that is the case. And I think that it, it's possible, as you mentioned, that this is just a smaller subset of patients. And so we're seeing some bias within this subset. As we are broadening uh, this cohort of studied patients, we, we, it, it'll be curious to see whether or not that, that percentage increases. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, you wonder if you know, Richter's transformation is just really a complication at the end stage of CLL. And since these patients were treated earlier with BTK inhibitors, maybe it's not, you know, originally they thought BTK inhibitors could predispose, you know, cause a predisposition to have people transform into Richter's transformation. And, um, and uh, maybe that it's, it's just the course of the disease, not in the timing at which the BTK inhibitor was given. So, so that is interesting and, and, and a promising result um, for patients. And maybe treating with targeted therapy controls disease better, and, and, and maybe we'll see less Richter's transformation, you know, uh, all, you know, really just extrapolation of that data. Um, uh, what, so what are the next steps for this research? I think there are a few next steps. I think there, there, uh, the, the obvious thing to do is to kind of continue to follow these patients and see how they do. Um, well, we're also broadening the cohort, broadening um, the set of patients that we're analyzing. And I think that the things that we're interested in are a fewfold. First, of the patients who were discontinued from BTK therapy, um, a large proportion of them continue to receive other lines of therapy. I think more than 50% received additional lines of therapy. And of those patients, 80% received um, venetoclax or BCL2 targeting therapies and distant lines of uh, therapy. So and I, my understanding is that it's not been formally studied the extent to which subsequent treatment with venetoclax is able to rescue those patients, although there is anecdotal clinical data and preclinical data suggesting that Patients that have treat, been treated with and failed BTK inhibitors may respond well to a BCL2 inhibition. So that's one thing that we're interested um, in following up. That's great. Um, and to see, you know, the rate at which people respond and how long they still respond to those subsequent therapies, I think is really important. Um, well, this has been really great. Do you have any um, major take-home messages for patients to know about your research? I think there's a few take home points. I think the first is um, to know that for patients, even for patients who don't respond to these therapies, that we're still thinking of them and we're thinking of ways um, to get on top, to stay on top of their disease, even when these promising therapies don't work. Um, and I think the second thing to take away um, is the idea that this data speaks to the, to the, to the strength, um, but also the weaknesses of these BTK inhibitors and also points to a potential role of BTK inhibitors that are not covalent, but are non-covalent. Um, and by that, I mean inhibitors that can bypass the presence of these disqualified mutations at cysteine 481. And as we know, there's data now emerging for nemtabrutinib and pertabrutinib. And these data suggest that there is, there is some sort of a need um, for those inhibitors. And, and I, I love to see how they do when they finally do um, hit the clinic.
Yeah, great points. I, I think um, these two drugs you just mentioned, nemtobrutinib and pertinibrutinib, they're not yet uh, approved for CLL, um, but pertobrutinib was recently approved for a different type of blood cancer called mantle cell lymphoma. And so we may see you know, more and more data about these drugs and CLL and other types of lymphoma. So great points. Um, well, thanks so much for taking the time to share your research with us today, Dr. Lin. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Stevens. It's been my pleasure.